How's that? Can everyone hear? It's uncomfortably loud. All right, can everyone hear me okay? Um, online, Nat and Justin, can you guys hear me? If you can just give me a thumbs up or um, wave, raise your hand, either one. Cool. All and um, Bo will be monitoring the um, online chat, so if you guys have questions, feel free to post them in here. Um, it won't be live on my screen, so just so you're aware. Uh, if you want to check real quick in the Slack, or um, in the Google Meet, make sure the Screen's presenting properly. Yeah, just look for it to work here. Okay, quick technical check, then we'll be underway. <clears throat> Or if someone else wants to log into um, the Google Meet real quick, I just want to make sure this screen is showing um, as we broadcast. Um, thank you guys for coming out today. We have a lot to go over, um, but we're going to kind of blitz through the first few points, uh, first few things fairly quickly, because um, point number three is probably what everyone is here to hear about and talk about. Um, so we'll get to that as quick as we can. Um, quick summary on financials. Um, we knew that July or June and July were going to be net negatives for us. We had a couple of big invoices that came in. As expected, um, July um, was similar. Um, when we're not doing events or not billing for events, we are running about a net loss of about $6,000 a month. Um, so when invoices fall in good months um, or fall in comps, we have good months like June where we had a net positive of 18,000. Um, July was a little bit quieter for when invoices fell and we had a couple of issues with our billing system that rolled some invoices over into August. Um, so the net, the true net negative for July was closer to about 6,000 um, than is listed here. We are working on switching over to an accrual accounting system rather than cash, which better reflects um, when programs are delivered, when memberships actually happen. This is very much just cash in, cash out, and can look really, really weird when you um, are invoicing and have net 30 terms and things like that. Um, so overall, we're doing pretty good. Um, we have a current account balance of just over $40,000 um, and a further balance in Stripe, which is where all of our membership um, is processed, of about $10,000. So about $50,000 or so in total in the bank right now, um, which is down a little bit over the last couple of months, um, but still in good shape um, going forward. We're going to be restarting the summit programs fairly soon. That boosts our revenue. Um, those kick on in October. Um, and we have some big events coming up that we'll talk about um, a little bit as well. Um, some great hackathons um, in the works and some big conferences um, that we booked for um, October and November. So I'll share some details on those as we get into it. Um, Full screen. 
Uh, I can't do full screen mode. Oops. Maybe. It's not. Get the three dots again. Right in the middle on the right. To the to the right percent. Yeah, that four. Yep. There we go. Cool. All right. Um, any questions on this? Obviously, this is what we're here for. All right, um, we've had some really solid membership growth the last few months. We're averaging um, about seven to eight uh, members each month net growth. Um, so it's been good to see that trending upwards. Uh, we did have a lot of cancellations this month as students are going back to school. Um, but we, so we anticipate this month membership will probably be fairly flat on growth or a little bit, um, a little bit slower growth. Um, I think we had about six or seven additional memberships um, that were suspended this month um, as students are going back to school. Um, so we know that that cycle happens um, every summer. Uh, it's something that we anticipate and expect. Um, but overall, membership numbers are up, um, which has been really good. Um, the Hive um, had a couple of vacancies for about a month or so, but that's back up to full. We had one turnover this past month. That desk was available for our, all of 18 hours before uh, someone else snatched it up. Um, and this is one of the areas that, um, as we talk about our expansion plans, um, we'll be really highlighting is we are getting requests almost every day for dedicated desk space. And we have been full for pretty much the last year solid. Um, so it is very much a, if we had more desks, we would be having more people, more members, more startups here. Um, and that's been a really big pain point for us as an organization. So we'll be talking about um, our expansion plans to, um, to tackle that. We also tried a couple of different marketing programs um, on Yelp and Nextdoor. Um, so far, without the dedicated desks, um, the cost benefit seems to be relatively low uh, because, again, a lot of people who are looking on Yelp for co-working space want a dedicated desk. Um, so we've had relatively low conversion, lots of interest. Um, so once we have a little bit more space available, um, we'll be restarting those because we did really drive up the amount of traffic that we had. Unfortunately, it was traffic that we couldn't necessarily offer a, um, a membership that met their needs to. Um, overall membership uh, revenue has been um, increasing. Um, we had highlighted before that we moved our um, event billing out of Nexus. Um, that's why you see this big drop here um, from April to May. Um, rolling all the billing all together was really hiding um, more accurate reporting on membership growth and things like that. Also costing us money. Um, we've moved all of our event billing to direct invoicing through QuickBooks. Um, and that way we aren't hit with additional fees, um, three to four percent in event billing when most of those are in the thousands of dollars adds up pretty quickly. Um, so that's been one area that we've been able to save a little bit of money. Um, that's going to definitely add up as time goes on. Um, but I do want to highlight that membership growth is the number one thing that we like really, really want to focus on. Um, and that is um, standard memberships, student memberships, as well as dedicated desks, um, hive memberships, and things like that that will be expanding. Any questions on this? All right. Um, so a couple of updates. Uh, we're in the process of hiring a membership coordinator associate. Uh, this will be the person that is really responsible on a day-to-day -day basis of um, being at the front desk, um, answering questions, giving tours, and being a resource for everyone here. Um, so if you have a problem or have you know, want connections or have a project that you're looking for people to work with on, this will be the person that you can go to and they are there just to help members you know, have a better experience here, um, you know, build their resume, connect with other people, whatever it may be, their entire role is built around supporting and developing membership here. Um, so they'll be responsible for doing outreach, um, going to local events, um, publicizing what HackerDojo is working on. 
Um, and then you know, helping drive also member retention, making sure that members who come and join us have the best experience possible. Um, so we're in the process right now. Um, we had the job posting up for a week and received over 100 applicants. Um, and uh, the first round uh, phone interview process is going on right now. Um, we narrowed that 100 down to about 25 that we felt had pretty strong resumes. Um, and so those are meeting, doing virtual interviews with myself and Tiana. Um, and then the final candidates, when we narrow that further down, will be meeting with a board member, um, a member of the community, so a um, Hacker Dojo member. Um, we are reaching out to a couple of people. If you're interested in potentially being part of that interview process, um, let us know and we'll see if your schedule matches up um, with what we need. Um, and then meeting in person for a final round with Tiana and myself. Um, you guys actually won't have access to the candidates in progress. Um, but if you have questions along the way, feel free to reach out to me. Um, we are finalizing a uh, conference for 150 to 200 people in November with ByteDance. ByteDance is TikTok's parent company. Uh, some of you may remember we had a TikTok developer uh, conference a couple months back. They had a good time, um, enjoyed the facility, so we're working on expanding that. That will be a free conference um, and it's going to be an all day um, event with a um, wine, beer, soda reception afterwards um, in, I think, November 11th. Um, I don't recall the date. We'll publicize it out. Definitely mark that on your calendars. It's going to be a really fun event. They're bringing in some catering for food. We'll have a food truck or two here as well. Um, should be a really, really fun event and will hopefully be one of the inaugural events for um, our new space, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, this um, also is maybe our first like major partnership with Bike Dance. We're actually getting set up with them as a vendor to make billing and future events a little bit easier um, so they can um, essentially just have a direct line, say, call us up be like, hey, we want to host an event. We're already in the system and set up, um, and so we're pretty excited about building that relationship long term. Uh, we're also working on a hackathon in partnership with Red Bull for October. Um, that will be, um, that is October 11th. Um, and that will be primarily aimed at college students, um, but everyone's going to be welcome. Um, and um, Red Bull has been a really great sponsor um, and partner. Um, at the Fun Hackathon, they came and handed out Red Bulls to everyone who won one. They donated the little fridge in the back um, and give us periodic donations of product for our game nights and things like that. Um, so they're also really interested. Um, they have a great program called um, Red Bull Basement, which is really um, a very abbreviated form of a hackathon. You come up with an idea, you submit that idea, and if you are selected, uh, Red Bull will actually fund that idea. It's all centered around making the world a better place. Um, so it's a really kind of forward, forward looking, um, exciting initiative that they're on. Yeah. So oh, what was it called again? It's called Red Bull Basement. Um, we're working, nothing confirmed yet, but we're talking with the um, her agents. We're working on bringing Zyla Foxlin up as the keynote speaker for that. Those of you who may know her from YouTube, um, one of my favorite content creators and just an all around phenomenal person. Um, so fingers crossed, working on that. Um, we're also gonna be hosting the Mountain View Chamber of Commerce Mixer on September 26th. So if you wanna get a little bit more involved in Mountain View, civic and community life. Uh, this will be a great event to attend. Um, we are a Chamber of Commerce member um, and so we'll be hosting a lot of local businesses who want to build better ties within the community um, on September 26th. I think it's about $20 per person um, and I believe Hacker Dojo members will get in for free but we're finalizing the details on that right now. Any questions on those? We're also hosting the after hours part of the NASA Space Apps Challenge um, first weekend of October. Um, so put that on your calendar. We have a couple of people in the community that are helping organize that. Um, so it should be a really fun event. Um, we'll have DJs, um, you know, definitely lots of flashing lights and music going on into the wee hours of the morning um, and probably a couple of tours over at NASA um, as well um, over the weekend. So stay tuned for more details on that one. 
Any events I'm missing that I should talk about? Okay. All right. This is the critical one. Um, we've been talking a lot um, as a board with the community um, and uh, over the last few months about some of the core challenges that we face as an organization. And the thing that comes up over and over and over again is space use. Uh, when we have a hackathon, when we have an event and the space isn't available for members and guests to be here and working, that's a problem. And it's a problem that we take really, really seriously. Um, we've been working, um, keeping an eye on properties in the area and in particular next door, because we knew that next door would be a really attractive expansion opportunity um, if we were able to get rates that made sense. They had been posting rates that didn't make sense for us and initial talks didn't go anywhere. Um, but last month they dropped the offered price for next door. Um, and so I reached out to their realtor to or their broker to restart talks and just say like, Hey, you haven't had anyone through in a year. How low will you go? Turns out the answer is pretty low. Um, so we have a um, signed letter of intent to um, accept a lease on the terms that we've agreed to, to take the adjacent 10,000 square feet. You mean back here? Yep. Right here. Next door. This, this, is, this is not a done deal. Um, but the, but the tr until it's until it is signed, but the ink is on it. But both the landlord and us have agreed on the terms. Um, so we have a couple of final things that we need to iron out. The current terms, as they stand, will be a complete restructure of the lease here as well. So right now we're paying about two dollars and thirty-five cents a square foot. That lease also has a six-month termination clause. The landlord can say you have six months to move by. Um, as of December of this year. So very, very, you know, not a great lease for us. That's a really big challenge if the landlord says, hey, you have to move in six months. Um, how many of you have tried to move your house in six months? <laughs> Much less an entire uh, hacker space. Um, so that goes away. Um, so we will be taking the entire 16,000 square feet at $1.25 a square foot. Um, this is a huge, huge decrease in the cost on this side that is more than offset by the fact that we're taking up 10,000 square feet on that side. Uh, so it is a net increase for us, but it's a much smaller net increase than we were anticipating. Um, we are also getting three months rent abatement, which is essentially three months of no rent as we build out the adjacent space. And that's three months on the entire space. So that will allow us to also build up our cash reserves because we won't be paying our current, you know, thirteen thousand dollars or so per month um, in rent. Yes. And we'll save that cash reserve for the day when we have to build up. Yes and no. <laughs> we'll get to that. That's three slides down. Um, it will allow us. Yeah. So what's the net change in the monthly cost? Um, all told, it'll probably be about a twelve thousand dollar net um, change um, to take the adjacent space. And that is accounting for IT expenses, for um, CAM, which is your community, community area maintenance expenses, the rent increase, and things like that. We have a pretty solid pathway for affording that, um, but it's a big jump. Right now, we're paying about $16,000 a, a month um, in just rent and CAM fees, not including maintenance and everything else. So like our net expenses um, for this space are about $20,000 a month. Um, so we're getting more than twice the space for about half the increase of what we're paying now. Um, it opens up a lot of doors for us. That's why like we looked at this, like this is a really solid offer. Um, and our broker said that they hadn't seen an offer like this at all um, in recent times. So we're pretty excited. Um, there's a couple of caveats to that. This is a 29 month lease. They did not, their hard sticking point was no uh, lease longer than our current termination for our lease right now, which is um, end of 2026. So we have 29 months for this space and next door. The landlord does plan to either sell or um, redevelop this parcel with current economic conditions. We'll see if that actually happens. That's a bridge we're going to cross in 20 months or so. Um, but this is a longer, more stable lease than we currently had on the table where they had the six month termination clause. So that's a net win for us. Um, 
We have started doing some financial projections for this expanded space. Um, if you want to sit down and go through those uh, with me, more than happy to. Um, the number of dedicated desk spaces that we will have available will almost completely offset the cost of our rent increase. That doesn't count all the other costs, increased staffing, things like that, but just in dedicated desks will be coming close to break even on rent for this space. Um, we know that that's a really big, um, you know, really popular commodity right now that we haven't had available. So this gives us another 20 or so dedicated desk spaces that we can have up um, within a month or two. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, there are a lot of interest, or there's some interest for like, um, like office spaces, um, like an entire suite, or like just like single office spaces. Yeah, um, the question is, um, there's been a lot of interest in like dedicated office space or suites for startups where you have multiple people in a room. We're still doing space planning, which will I'll show you what our proposed floor plan is. The long, the short, the long answer is maybe. Uh, the short answer is we'll have something that approximates that, whether it's cubicle pods or um, you know uh, collapsible walls, things like that, blocking off different areas. Um, but our floor plan is going to be a little bit weird because we're essentially taking two spaces that prioritize on opposite sides, decade desks, and then co-working space in the middle. Um, so it's going to be a little bit in flux over the next couple of weeks as we finalize our space planning. Um, all of this has come together in the last month. Um, so we've been moving relatively quickly through this process. We have a bunch more that we are going to do um, before we actually sign the lease, um, including getting estimates for IT infrastructure build out and things like that to make sure that we can like really hit the ground running and we have a really good handle on all the costs that are gonna be associated with this. Um, so we're in the process of doing that right now um, and we'll be sharing all that information out um, so everyone can review you know, what that looks like. But there's a lot of costs that are involved in running a space like this um, and we want to make sure that we're being responsible with the organization. Um, but so far, everything that we've looked at really says this is a really strong move forward for us as an organization. Yeah. Uh, for the network infrastructure, we'll be taking the help of volunteers, possibly. Um, we have a couple of different options on the table. We've talked with um, AT&T about doing a full Cisco Meraki uh, system for all the Wi-Fi. It's more of an industry solution than the current Fortinet access points, but it's only a small step up. Um, so we're waiting for pricing back on that, but that would give us a little bit more in-house control through the Meraki control panel. Um, to manage the network on our, on our own. That also means we have to have someone in-house managing the network. Um, so there's you know, trade-offs on all those decisions. And so we're waiting until we have um, costs. Um, if we just get uh, four net access points and just expand off our current system, then we'll definitely be taking volunteers to run the hard lines to all the access points, gain those mounted up, everything wired in. Um, if at t handles it, they actually handle the install and all of that. We'll just be running um, lines to where we want the um, access points hardwired in. So I have one follow-up question. Um, do you also have some interest in working with technologies? Yeah, T-Mobile definitely had interest. That would be as a backup system, so like a wireless backup to the, um, the fiber that we currently have. Um, and so we are with AT&T for the foreseeable future for our primary primary internet connection. But we all know what happens when that internet goes down. It's not a good situation. So having a backup of some sort um, through at least like a 5G cellular or something along those lines is something that we are going to take a look at um, so that we can make sure that door locks always function and that like some of the core functionality that requires on some connectivity has a little bit more redundancy than it currently does right now. So that's definitely one of the things we're taking a look at. Yeah. So like um, the, the upcoming lease, if you secure it, will be 29 months. But I guess the landlord is not going to extend our lease for this one. So you're saying the, 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 the lease for this space is getting thrown out entirely. So the, the lease will be 29 months for both spaces together. Oh, I see. Yeah. 
And that's why the rent abatement is will be rent free. We still have to pay the um, cam and maintenance costs. So we're still paying each month, but it's about $13,000 each month in base rent that we're not paying for this space currently. So that's a huge, huge helps us have a little bit more cash in the bank to do the infrastructure build out, bring in desk, things like that that we need to do. All right, any other questions on this? Amazing, awesome work. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> it's been a great team effort. Um, Michelle, our broker, has been fantastic to work with. Um, the board has been um, really excited about this from you know pretty much as soon as we start talking about you know this might be on the market for a really low price. Um, we thought we'd get just that space for a dollar square foot, which would have been a ten thousand dollar net increase in rent. Um, we're actually getting for about sixty five hundred dollars net increase, so it was better than our initial projections were. Um, and that was Michelle's idea to restructure, to offer to restructure this lease as well. Is a landlord able to write off some of this because we are a nonprofit? Um, if they were doing structuring as a donation, yes. Um, but currently, this is just a straight lease. Um, they Maybe may they can structure it as a partial help. We we offered that, and um, for whatever reasons, they declined. Um, so I don't know. You know, I, I didn't talk with their accountant, um, but that was one of the things that we offered is we'll take on this yeah. space at full asking rate um, and pay all the maintenance costs and cam costs, which is about $5,000 a month or so. Um, and then you get the tax write off for the rest of it. And I don't think they had enough cash flow that that was attractive to them. So, um, so the short answer is we tried, they said no. Um, and we moved on to like, okay, then we'll just ask you for a dollar square foot for the entire price. You earlier, you mentioned the bike dance event that might uh, use the new space. Are you going to talk about the uh, schedule for physically taking over that? Uh, yes, physically we'll be taking over the space by the end of the month. This month? This month. Um, our current, the LOI lease date is August 15th, which is tomorrow, um, or whenever the lease is executed. We expect that that will happen by the end of the month. Um, we are going to be in there day one. The first thing that we'll be doing is moving all of the extra stuff that we have here, taking up space over into storage there to really clear this space out a little bit more, have it a little bit more functional. Um, and then we'll be prioritizing a couple of build out areas, which I have a map for um, here. Um, yeah, so this is this is 857 and 855. Um, we didn't in this program have 855 in already, but we already have this side relatively well figured out. There will be some changes to this side. Um, the back corner um, and back wall, furthest wall that way, um, is going to be a combined maker lab with the 3D printers, laser cutters, things like that. So these rooms that are currently up here will be consolidated into a much larger space with a lot more room, dedicated work tables, things like that, as well as some maker bays. Imagine a dedicated desk for someone who's making something. So um, like Dulot, all of you probably know Dulot. He was working on a huge 3D printer. Um, but he had to do it in the hive because we didn't have any room for him elsewhere and it just wasn't a great it wasn't a great solution for him so we'll have dedicated areas that are essentially dedicated desks um bays where you can set up your tools set up your project and have something you know essentially like a hive desk or a dedicated desk that is when you're working on a physical product that you need a little bit more space or maybe making some noises you're drilling or fumes or things like that um, so those back kind of three rooms are going to be dedicated towards um, maker area I make high. That means that this room is now going to be available for other use. That may be private offices, that may be additional hive desks. We're still doing some of the space modeling to figure out like what the optimal use is going to be. And that's one of the areas that I really want to uh, engage the community in sharing your ideas. We'll be talking about how to do that um, shortly. But the primary areas that we're going to focus on the most getting up and running as soon as possible are going to be the main space here and the hive in the back corner. The hive in the back corner is going to be dedicated desk space um, and probably um, cubicle pods. 
Um, we already have a um, set of very nice cubicles that I was able to secure a while back. Um, and so we'll be able to configure that so that startups could have a pod that is relatively enclosed of dedicated desks. Um, so it'll be a little bit different from our current high setup, um, but we'll be looking at how we can maximize that space um, and create a space that is flexible enough that we can accommodate startups or accommodate small work groups, people who want to work together. Um, but also we don't want to turn into a corporate like cubicle farm. So we're looking for ways and ideas to make this space creative, fun, exciting to be in while having some delineation between different spaces. Um, there are a number of natural skylights through um, a number of these rooms. So the lighting is not as terrible as it looks like on paper, um, but we know lighting condition is one of the core things that we'll be tackling early on. Um, but those two spaces are really the most critical spaces for us. Those are our critical pathways that we need to get up and running as soon as possible. The main space, because we already have um, events that are being requested to be held in that space. We toured with Bike Dance. They know that this is a space that their event will likely be happening in um, because that space can accommodate 150 to 200 people. This side can't. Um, and so once we get to events at that scale, they help us tremendously as an organization, get a lot of traffic through the door, are a lot of fun, um, but we don't have the room for it here. Um, so that is one instance where we'll still have some mix of um, space where we'll be have to be a little bit flexible that day on where people are working. But we'll have two rooms that we're able to work between um, to make that happen and make sure that there's always desks available for people to come in and work. Um, and then the Hive, as I mentioned before, the um, revenue from that supports us in a huge way as an organization. And that room comes close to offsetting our base costs for rent for the expansion over what we're currently paying. Right now, as an organization in this space, um, year to date, we're doing better than break even. Um, so we know that we can manage the expenses on this side. So we're trying to isolate some of the expanded expenses that we'll be taking on and looking at what that delta is and making sure that we can cover that as quick as possible. So that's the room that is really, really critical for us to get up and filled in short order. Um, and fortunately, like I said, we've had a lot of inquiries and a lot of people who are interested in that. Uh, so we anticipate that within that first three months, that space will probably be, um, be occupied. I also want to note that current Hive and members will get first shot at these spaces. These will not go public until members here have a chance to reserve it first. You've already been here, you've been supporting us. We're expanding because of your support and that you've been a part of this community, you will get first shot at these. So we'll be doing that announcement and letting people sign up. It's not gonna be a financial commitment. You can just put your name down and say, as soon as this is available, I want a call that says I'm interested and then you'll be able to decide at that point if you wanna take it. Yeah. So we have, we have some number of like, um, the Academy member run events, like say the Rust Group or whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious for the new space, uh, what kinds of, what rooms will be available for event makers? So the classroom here is going to remain one of the more core event spaces for larger meetups like that. Um, but we also will have uh, behind the lobby is this Lounge Nuke and Corporate Events, Lounge Nook. Um, that space will be available for gatherings up to about 20 people. The classroom will be the 30 to 40 um, person, 20 to 40 person range. Um, and then we'll have this side as well, more freely available for events because the primary co-working area is going to be the main space over there. Um, so this space, this stage will be a little bit better set up on a regular basis for events. And that's one of the core things that we're looking for is it takes a lot of time to set up for an event, tear, tear down from an event. Event organizers have to come in early, set up AV, set up, you know, move tables, move chairs. And we want to have that be a little bit more streamlined. So it's regularly set up for events, for workshops. And so people can just come in and get started relatively quickly. And then occasionally, if we need this side for co-working, because we're doing a really big event over there, then we'll bring tables in here. But it's going to be much, much easier to manage having two separate spaces rather than the overlap. You had a question first? So, uh I'm not an architect or anything else, but uh, you know, given the, the 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 critical role of the hive as supporting it financially, 
I'm, I'm a little uh, 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 uneasy about why it's, it's the smallest section of the whole floor plan of the new space. Like, for example, we have these huge computer labs and stuff like this. Um, we, that's a great question. Um, mostly it's how that space is kind of currently laid out. Um, and we'll expand and contract based on like if we fill up that hive, I can mention like this room over here may also become an additional hive space, additional dedicated desk space. Um, by consolidating different things, we are going to open up additional options um, that will be expanded dedicated desk space. Um, but mostly we want to make sure that we're serving the entire community well. And so having um, a larger computer lab, that's going to be flex event space as well. So that will we'll have the ability to set up like you know, um, food carts in there. It's a tiled floor instead of the carpeted floor. Um, and so that'll be an easier area to clean up if there's spills and messes. Um, we are still, like I said, still keeping it relatively flexible. Um, so that's not 100% locked in. Um, but that's actually a bigger space than it looks like on paper. Um, and if we fill that in the first three months, then we'll definitely be talking about how we balance the rest of the space. Um, and But that's kind of the, the room that made the most sense to be kind of set up that way. Um, access control is one of the other answers to that. Um, there's areas that'll be access controlled uh, for just the members for that area. Um, and the computer lab is, for instance, is one of the hardest spaces to access control because there's like six different entrances to it. Um, and so you just have a harder time managing that traffic um, and things like that. These are also kind of like large blocks of this is what makes the most sense to us. Um, that may change in the next month as we get in there and get things sorted out. But yeah, great question. Yes. Um, are, is there any, do you know if I will get the posters? Um, policy posters, I'll follow up with Emily on that. I know she was doing a couple of tweaks for the um, the graphics, um, and as soon as those are done, we're getting them printed. I, I love the question. Mm -hmm. um, since, especially when we all have um, you know, like, access for people to set up projects and so on in the space. Um, I wonder, uh, is there going to be a question that we answered today? Um, I wonder what, how can we have better controls to ensure those? I mean, if there are glaring quality issues or uh, safety, safe, are you asking like, safety and making sure they're qualified to use equipment and things like that? Um, that and also uh, do prevent the issue of use of the uh, states or, and if they're declaring red, red, uh, red flag, and it could be even like, to do with uh, non-maker space. Um, yeah, I, I don't know that we want, we'll dive into that too deeply yeah, here. Yeah. Um, it's definitely something Access control and management of a larger space like this is definitely something that we're talking a lot about um, because it is going to be a more difficult space to manage. That's one of the reasons why we're prioritizing hiring a couple of new positions right now. Uh, this will require a couple more people um, beyond what we're currently hiring for. Um, with this expanded space, it's going to become pretty much essential that we have a front desk person on all of our for all of our public hours. After hours, not so much because it'll just be members. But 10 a.m. to 9 p.m., we're going to need someone that is managing entry and exit at the space. We're also going to, um, with this new space, um, it'll be a little bit more rigorous coming in the door um, for requiring guests to sign in, sign waivers, get a badge, wear that badge. Um, and so we're talking about um, options for members to have um, FOBs or using that app on Kissy to have essentially a quick badge in, just check in, memberships active carry on, go back your day. We want to make it as seamless as possible for members coming in, but we also want to really make sure that um, we know who's in the space because it's going to be a much larger space um, with a lot more opportunities for problems to happen. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're managing that at the front door um, right off the bat so we don't have a you know, person that we don't know wandering through the space um, who may or may not have signed a waiver going you know, into the maker lab um, or something like that, where there might be like power tools or things like that going on. Just uh, kind of on that safety theme, I don't know if everybody uh, heard, but uh, Google set fire to their uh, electronic lab uh, yesterday. Did they? Yeah, oh. $200,000 damage. Yeah, yeah uh, unattended uh, electronic uh, thing in the lab. Yeah, um, up in San Francisco, also um, 
my good friend Ryan Sprock um, runs um, Human Made, and they had an electrical fire um, a few months back, and they're just now getting back up and running. Uh, electrical, like you've probably seen me up in the ceiling a few times. Um, electrical is a really, really huge concern, and it's one of the reasons why we're trying to move away from daisy chained um, power strips and things like that, um, because it is a very real fire hazard and it can shut an organization down in a heartbeat. We do have good insurance, but um, a fire, you know, here and everyone out of the space for a month or two will lose a lot of members because you need spaces to work. Um, so we take that really seriously. That's why a lot of the electrical, like we just pulled it out entirely um, so that there aren't random runs that we don't know necessarily where they go. Um, but in the um, adjacent space, we're going to be looking at that real, real carefully um, because yeah, fire danger is like, that's, that's like one of my number one fears in a space like this. Um, when you're working with electronics, working with computers, working with cell phones, batteries, whatever it may be, it is always a concern. Um, it is a fully sprinkled space. So from a safety perspective, we're in good shape, um, but we want to make sure that we're being really proactive about operating safely as well. Yeah, you know, I was, I was there, you know, and okay. the, I mean, not, not this link, but you know, I was at Google, you know, and I had, you know, got qualified for access to that space. One of the things I was thinking about the training that they did there was all about their liability to make sure that somebody didn't hurt themselves. But I don't think there was anything about, oh, what do you, should you do? What common sense rules should you be following to not set fire to place? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's one that we're definitely going to be um, implementing some better classes and workshops in a more structured format, um, talking about things like that, particularly in associated, association with the maker area. Can you recap the question? Oh, um, yeah. Sorry, recapping the question. Um, um, noted that there's a fire at Google Labs and just wanted to make sure that we're being proactive about training common sense ways to not start fires. Like there's a lot of people who don't know that you shouldn't daisy chain um, power strips um, or you know bypass you know uh, grounding protection things like that because they don't know. Or leave experimental equipment unattended on the workbench. Or leave experimental equipment unattended on the workbench. Not a good thing. Or playing with lithium batteries inside the space. Um, you know, we did have a battery fire here a while back um, that fortunately wasn't bad, um, but that's why we have concrete floors, and uh, we want to be cognizant of what some of those dangers are. So we'll definitely be implementing some better workshops and training for that. Um, and to get back to the um, point of better signage, um, better signage for expected practices and expected community norms will also help with that a lot. Last year, for uh, several months, it seemed like, we had a high school robotics group take over the classroom yes. regularly. And that seems to be a good attraction for, uh, for us for, uh, to bring in. But the, they were constrained, I can see, by the fact, first of all, of course, they were keeping us out. And second, a lot of the uh, robots <laughs> <laughs> were big enough that they weren't really useful. They were floor robots. They weren't uh, uh, tabletop robots. And Robert, Robert is here right now. Yeah. And I noticed that he feels, Robert feels constrained about only being able to do tabletop robots. So to bring it to, where would we have a space that does not have furniture where high schoolers can actually run robots on the floor. I have a personal interest in this because I have an interest in flying robots, as you know. Yep. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to have a place where I could test one without scaring people around me. Yeah, that, the question to recap um, was where will, last year we had a um, high school robotics team, first robotics team that was utilizing the library, or um, not library, um, classroom space and displacing members as a result, but also we're a really attractive place because we are a place that they can come together and work. Um, the maker hive spaces, those dedicated build bays that we're talking about, that's explicitly what those are designed for, is to have fenced off space that you can build a larger project um, and have a little bit more floor space within that maker area um, for high school robotics teams or adult robotics teams or someone building a large 3D printer, or someone who's working on you know, a robotic dog, whatever it may be, having not just like bench job space that you have to clean up at the end of the day, um, but having a dedicated space that you can set up your project and work consistently through, um, that's explicitly what those are, um, are designed for. 
And it, yeah, it's definitely something that we've been looking at as something that we would like to incorporate um, without disrupting the community the way that it did this past year. Uh, could you just please go over again the reservation policy of how somebody would access that, get, make use of that makerspace? You did earlier, but I didn't. Um, so the makerspace will be um, the, the yeah, makerspace will be um, not so much reservation based. The maker bays, the kind of like dedicated desk reserve space, um, that's where if you're building a project and you want to leave it, that's where you'll actually be reserving. And that'll be more in line with getting a hive desk. It'll be your space 24 7. No one else is working in that particular space. You have it dedicated for your use. The hives or the um, maker space itself, uh, we haven't talked too much about the specific like management of reservation systems yet. Um, but with the 3D printers and the laser cutters that we'll have in there, um, it'll be kind of how it is now. You can reserve those uh, facilities on Nexigus um, if you need a specific tool. Otherwise, it'll be walk in for members who are signed off on that area. All right. Um, any other questions? We, we can also, um, we'll have time for questions this evening also. I do want to get into a couple more slides because um, we do have to talk about a couple of really critical issues. Can, can we hold later? Okay, cool. Uh, so underlying all of this is looking at the future of Hacker Dojo. We are only here for 29 months. We know that pretty solidly. They're unlikely to renew the lease at the end of this. So we are already looking at what the next space will look like. We've been talking with Google about potentially getting a space. And it seems like the 29 months may align well with their schedule. But if it doesn't, we have to look at what our next home will look like. Um, I don't want Hacker Dojo to keep moving every five years. Um, so next space that we are looking at, we want to make sure that it's a sustainable space for the community, large enough to accommodate everything we want to do, and a longer term home. 10 year lease is really what I'm looking for. Um, to accomplish a larger move like that is going to require at least three hundred to $400,000 in reserve. So what we're looking at with this space is, does this give us the facility and the capability to run enough programs and diversify our revenue um, enough that we can build over the next two years that three hundred to four hundred thousand dollar reserve that will allow us to successfully transition into a new space at the end of that. Uh, so we've targeted a couple of areas that we are currently very space constrained that are really big revenue drivers. Youth camps, you guys have probably heard me talk before, is one of the largest things that we just don't have space for here, but is a huge revenue driver on the order of maybe three hundred thousand dollars by itself over the next two years. Uh, corporate team building programs. This used to be really popular pre-COVID and it's starting to come back now where corporate teams want to come and have an off-site fun event that they work together and learn how to partner with each other. That can be everything from wrestling robots to um, just building little light boxes, whatever it may be. They are looking for those off-site opportunities um, in the plan. We know down here the lounge nook and corporate events. We've kind of bracketed that space as a space that we can do some of those 10, 15, 20 person corporate events in. Um, those are really big revenue drivers as well. Um, and then the ongoing events and paid workshops that we're already doing. Um, we already have the one with Bite Dance. We want to increase the cadence of those and having dedicated event space that we don't have to set up and take down and tell everyone, oh, you can't work here for the day will allow us to do those much more often. We're currently turning events like that away because we don't want to impact membership uh, members here beyond what we already are. And so this will give us the capability to do those events on a regular basis and build a clientele that knows that you can come here and have a really high quality event that's set up, AV is set up and works right, um, there's chairs that are comfortable. It's not a mishmash of a bunch of different things. They can have a relatively refined event. They don't have to spend as much time coordinating, set up, clean up, things like that. That's another really big revenue opportunity for us. Um, so in rough numbers, um, this is kind of how um, we've looked at the breakdown of what our revenue opportunities are over the next 29 years beyond meeting our base expenses. So our assumptions in this is that we will cover our base expenses through membership growth, dedicated desks, um, you know, hive desks, things like that. 
that will cover our baseline expenses. So these are opportunities beyond those covering those baseline expenses that we feel we can achieve some really good revenue growth over the next two years. Youth camp, as I mentioned, is the biggest one. Um, $300,000 is well within um, reach over the next two years for the number of camps that we can offer and the amount of space that we would have to dedicate to that. That may be what this room turns into periodically um, and becomes a small classroom um, where we're having eight students working through you know, tech-related projects. Uh, the classroom may be reserved more regularly during the day for summer camps because we don't typically have meetups and events in that during the day and we'll have other quiet workspace um, available on the other side. We're still looking at how we're going to balance all those space uses, but that's one of the really big ones. Corporate team building events. Um, these are all over the place as far as revenue goes. Sometimes it's, it's $500, sometimes it's $3,000 and everywhere in between. Um, Tech Shop, if any of you are familiar with the Makerspace, that was their single largest leader in revenue as an organization um, above anything else. Um, I think the Redwood City was doing like $200,000 a year in corporate team building events. It was a huge amount of money. They weren't running the rest of the organization responsibly, and so they didn't survive. Um, but this is a really big opportunity for us. This is a relatively low conservative number, um, in large part because we don't currently have a team to run these events. So this is a little bit harder to um, set up and get running. We already have teachers who are teaching these programs um, at Summit Public Charter School with us. So we have the teachers in place. Um, we just need the space and we can roll those events out for youth camps pretty much right away. And then events and hackathons. We mentioned this before. This is one of the really big drivers that we want a larger space. How many of you have fun when you come to a hackathon or an event here? They're fun. Like it's, it's a big draw to bring people to the space because they're really fun, cool events. Um, one of the things that we would like to be known is as the hackathon capital of Silicon Valley or of California. Uh, we want this to be the place that you come to have a fun, amazing hackathon. Um, and this space, this expansion, will give us the capability to take a step in that direction. Any questions on these? All right. So this is what we need because we have one half staff right now, hopefully up to two fairly soon. Um, we have a bunch of volunteers who have been phenomenal helping us along the way. And we have you know, inordinate amounts of appreciation for everyone who's pitched in for a cleaning day, for a moving day, wiped down the desks, cleaned up the kitchen area. All of the volunteers that pitch in, you are really the ones that make this space work on day to day. Um, we have a volunteer channel on Slack. If you want to be involved, particularly as we start to build out the space um, and are moving things and things like that, that's going to be the number one avenue to um, keep up to date with what's going on. If you're not already on Slack, get me your email um, and I'll send you an invite um, onto Slack so you can join that channel. You can also join on Discord, but Slack is a little bit more where we'll be focusing for this type of communication. Spreading the word. Um, Inviting your friends out, inviting coworkers out, inviting other people that you know. Come to an event, come to a game night, come to a hackathon. You guys have social media reach that we do not um, because you all have individual networks. And spreading the word about what we're doing here is a tremendous way to bring more people here, um, build excitement, potentially build members, um, and really grow the community in an organic way. Um, that's one of the ways that you can help us a tremendous amount. Um, yeah. Is there a, a good post that you have on either LinkedIn or Instagram that we can reshare? Uh, the question is, there, is there a good post that um, on LinkedIn or Instagram that we can share? Um, we post pretty regularly. Um, there is a generic one um, that I'll have Tiana post up in the next couple of days um, that you can share out. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really easy to just like like and share when we post up like, hey, we're doing a hackathon this weekend or we're doing a game night or we're doing a barbecue. Like and share those events. Um, it really does drive an increase in traffic. Um, and we get a lot of or like not organic because it's all algorithmically driven, but we do get a lot of event growth when our core members start liking and sharing those um, posts. Um, and then design. We want your guys' input on what the space looks like how it's laid out, 
uh, this is a space for the community and for everyone here. So like we have ideas about how we can make this all work, um, but we want your feedback and your ideas and your art suggestions. Like we want to know, like, do you want this room to be, you know, set up so that all the walls are decorated like a Super Mario world? Or do we want, you know, a graffiti artist to come in? Or do we want to, you know, do like find a local artist that, you know, highlights Silicon Valley? Like we want to know what you want this space to look like. Uh, because it's, we want this to be a vibrant space that reflects the community. It is a space that's fun to go to. Um, so we want all of your ideas in that. Um, again, the volunteer channel is going to be the number one space for that. Um, but we'll also be spinning up a design page uh, or a design channel um, that will be sharing ideas and uh, things like that for the new space. Um, and then donations. Um, looking at rough numbers, we probably need to raise about twenty to forty thousand um, dollars for the cost that we're going to incur for the um, adjacent space, um, and this is to make sure that we don't cut completely through our cash reserves right now. Um, we can spend ourselves down to zero dollars, and if anything goes wrong, we run out of money. We want to make sure that we have an appropriate buffer um, as we're doing this build out. And this is what we anticipate that for IT infrastructure, audiovisual setup, furniture, cleaning and decor, getting things painted, bringing artists in, um, redoing rugs if we need to, cleaning floors, all that costs money and it adds up pretty quickly. Um, and then additional equipment, um, you know, better printer, you know, things like that. It's going to add up pretty quickly. We think that we can do it for $20,000. We're saying $40,000 because we want to be conservative and don't want to have to ask twice back up. Oh, we were wrong. Um, so that is what our target right now is over essentially the next two to three months. We don't need that it's all right now, but what we do need to do right now is start. Um, so this QR code and the page that I'll load up um, in a minute is um, the, our donation page through Give Butter. Um, it's a great site. Uh, we actually get 100% um, of the donations. You can tip Give Butter if you want to, um, but 100% of the donations actually go to Hacker Dojo. They don't take out additional fees um, unless we let them. Um, every dollar counts. And I mean that very literally. If you can only donate a dollar, but you can donate a dollar and put your name as a donor, that matters because that is showing that there's a community and more people behind what we're doing. Um, and so when I say like every dollar matters, I mean it very, very literally, because we've been very, very fortunate. We had a donor earlier this year that gave us a half a Bitcoin. I reached out to them like, hey, we're expanding. We'd love another half a Bitcoin. Um, but those donors who have the capability to donate larger amounts, they look at how much organic grassroots support do you have? Like, do you have a few donors or do you have a lot of donors? Um, there's In fundraising, there's a rule called the 80-20 rule. 80% of your donations come from 20% of your donors. But that means that you need 80% small donors, grassroots donors, to show those larger potential donors that there's a community here that they are supporting, that is engaged, that cares about this organization enough that they'll go and take the time to donate a dollar or five dollars or ten dollars or whatever it may be. Uh, so that's where we're at. We hope by the end of the week, um, I've been authorized based on the current terms we have. When I have a lease in hand under these terms, I've been authorized to sign it. But before I sign it, we're going to do some gut checks as a board, as an organization, to make sure that this is the right move for us, that we have enough traction and movement forward, um, that we are have the community's support and engagement in this, and also that we have a good handle on all the different costs that we're going to be um, incurring in a move like this. So we have a few more things that we need to take care of as an organization before I sign a lease, but that's where we're at right now today. We had that vote last night. Um, and so you guys are really the first ones that are hearing about this in a very, very real way. We've been doing tours, we've been talking about it, um, but this is real now. Like we are about to, um, about to jump into this get an extra 10,000 square feet and really take Hacker Dojo um, a big step forward um, into 2024, 25 and beyond. So that's all that I've got for you guys today. I'm going to skip over to this other tab. Um, any questions before I hop out of here? 
Yes, Rob. The maker space in the back, will that still be accessible during outside meetups coming in? Likely, yes. Um, we're going to try to minimize like that space getting taken up by like a youth camp or right. something else like that. So you should be able to continue working for the most part. Eligible. Yeah. Um, that's one of the areas where we want to have some dedicated classroom spaces where we can like pull a couple machines out, utilize those in that space, and then put them back in. But in general, we want to make that equipment as available as possible. Yeah, everything on normal would be. Yeah. Work not. Yeah. I guess, but I have a question. Like, what is the vision for the computer lab space? So, oh, sorry. Yeah, um, yeah. What's the vision for the computer lab space? Um, so this is a combination. We want to have high-end computer systems in there that are capable of doing some systems for like competitive gaming, esports, things like that. We're looking to Red Bull to potentially support that area, but also people who can do rendering or um, systems that can do rendering, 3D design, things like that. Higher-end systems that will be typically beyond the capability of what a lot of people will have access to on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so those would, the gaming systems would be for non-members reservable by the hour um, as an additional revenue driver, um, like how Guildhouse down in San Jose does. Um, the workstations, the, um, like the higher end, like CAD stations, uh, things like that, those would also be reservable for members, um, but there wouldn't be a cost associated with that, uh, just a reservation system to make sure that that's broadly available. And then people outside the organization could come in and reserve those as well, but they'd be paying for that on an hourly basis. Yeah. Would there be um, like anything, any business focused on like networking and like learn? Very possibly. We would definitely like to um, incorporate an area where you can learn like hands on networking and how to set up, you know, server management and things like that. So we're looking at options for doing that. And that's one of the reasons why the computer lab is a little bit amorphous and potentially a little bit larger, because that may also be where like, part of the electronics lab is living, and there may be other things in there beyond just like spaces for computers. Um, but yeah, it's, there's a lot of interest in that area, um, but that area is not as fleshed out because it's kind of like our second tier priority um, behind the event space and the high space getting up and running. Filtration and all that for laser cutters, 3D printers. Yes, uh, filter, the question is filtration for laser cutters and 3D printers. Um, the One of the nice things about that backspace is there's already an existing roof vent that we can push air out of. Nice. Um, we're also um, now have a um, three-stage filter for the laser cutters. It's a coarse filter, HEPA filter, carbon filter um, that filters, you know, essentially lab-grade air out of it. Um, so even after like running the laser cutter air through it, uh, the air that comes out of it is better than the air that you are breathing the rest of the time. Um, so it's you know a constant air purifier for the space. Um, so that'll be when we need to move a laser to a different space. That'll be the solution that we use within that space. Um, but for the most part, everything that's in the maker space will likely be ducted directly out, um, and we'll. Um, are hopefully going to have some enclosed 3D printers that are also ducted out for doing ABS, ASA, and some of the more noxious um, um, filaments and things like that, as well as resin printers and stuff like that, stuff that you don't want to breathe. Um, so we're going to be looking pretty closely on how to make that space as safe and um, easy to use as possible and comfortable to use. Because like it may be safe, but if you get a headache from the fumes, like you're not having fun. Quick suggestion. Um, uh, like, if, if it becomes so much of a burden to make everyone get badges and that kind of stuff, this sounds like a huge enforcement headache. Um, I think uh, getting a Wi Fi access code as part of signing to Dojo would actually work. Yeah, um, and I, I think for the most part, those would be relatively equal, um, equally complex. But yeah, in an ideal world, like badging in coming through as a member through the front door um, is going to be as easy as running your phone over um, over an entry point and it lighting up green. Oh, and oh, I mean people who aren't members. Right. Um, for that, we do need them to sign the liability waiver. So that that's why we like really need a clear delineation of you're a member or you're not. Um, so you're required to sign in if you're not, because right now we have a lot of people who come in and either don't know that they have to sign in every time that they come in. Um, or just intentionally bypassing it. Um, and we need to make sure that that system is, is as smooth as possible. 
Um, so we are going to add more um, readers with QR codes that actually print out a badge as well. So you can just do it on your phone real quick, get the badge, and then um, enter on through. Um, but yeah, um, managing it through a Wi-Fi access code might also work. But for people who like might want to head to like the computer lab that may be wired or um, the maker space, maker area, where you may not need Wi-Fi, that breaks down a little bit. Um, and we just want to make sure that everyone coming through the door, we just have a name and email um, and you know contact point. Um, and that's also from a safety standpoint. We live in earthquake country. If we have an earthquake, that's that's actually how we pull um, our who's in the building log is right now like we have better better information on who is signed in as a guest accessible to me than members in the space i can tell roughly from wi-fi access um and who's like on the network but if you haven't been on your computer for half an hour like working in the electronics lab doing some soldering i may not know that you're in, an, in the building and in an emergency and evacuation i don't have good granularity of like making sure you get out safely this system badging in badging out if we make it seamless gives us that capability that we can know everyone that's in the building and make sure everyone gets out safely in an emergency. So there's a couple of different reasons why we want to want to go that direction. I wonder if it's easy to, um, because we do use iPad, I don't know if it's easy to integrate, maybe like the contact share option, or like iPhone, and then... Yeah, well, uh, the question is easy to integrate by contact share, um, and that's a great question. We'll talk about that when we're tackling some of the IT infrastructure. Um, I think that's a great option. I mean, like just be able to tag your phone and it shares your information or pre-fills the form. Um, I don't have a good answer for whether or not we can integrate that with our current equipment, um, but would love to love to have someone um, help out getting that system implemented for sure. Yes. What kind of Robert. pricing are you thinking about putting for the base? Um, sorry, give me one second. Let me get out of full screen mode. Should we get a scape or the X at the top? I tried both of those. Yeah, that X. That X. There we are. Um, thank you, both. <laughs> um, so, um, sorry, can you say your question again, Rob? Uh, the maker phase? Oh, pricing for those. Uh, they'll be pretty equivalent to high pricing. Okay, um, yeah, and it, it depends on the, um, we're gonna have a couple of different sizes for that. Right. So like five by tens, 10 by tens. Um, it's going to be a lower cost per square foot um, than a dedicated desk space. Um, but that's mostly because it's gonna kind of like be in the back of the space and not as like, like you don't have like the nice AC and everything. It'll right. still be AC, you know, air conditioned, but like won't be as comfortable a space. So, um, but we anticipate in the vicinity of current high pricing, so probably 375, 400 for like a five by 10. Easy. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we, um, like I said, we'll be getting that information out to the members first. So all of you can look at the different options, have an idea of what they are um, and get first shot at those. Yeah. Um, for Brooklyn, um, we may, we're going to figure out what we're doing with Brooklyn. Um, if we're going to still have it be um, conference room or podcasting room, things like that. We do have a bunch of sound panels that were donated. We're going to be using those to um, get a couple of rooms in better acoustic condition for doing podcasting and recording. Um, I know right now Brooklyn's a little bit echoey. Um, so we have a bunch of different colors, a bunch of different, they're all five by four by 10 um, sheets. Um, we're gonna be figuring out a room at least that will be a little bit more acoustically dampened um, utilizing those sheets. Um, we may also be using some of them to build new, um, build some additional uh, phone booth style ones. It's the same style of um, sound dampening that's in those. Um, so we're looking at different ways that we can use those, but they will be used in the space um, to provide color and flair and some sound uh, sound dampening as well. Okay. The light keeps moving. Yeah, yeah. So keeping the 
Oh, <laughs> there, there will be more lights like uh, lights like that. Um, yeah, it gets pulled out for game night and things like that. It doesn't always make it make its way back in there. And that's a big part of what we want to do is like we want to have more dedicated stuff so that things don't migrate um, as much as they currently are. All right. Any questions? Yes. Yes, I was wondering if you would be interested with by a big arcade, custom arcade. Yes. Um, so oh one of the, I'll pop back over to it real quick. You'll notice down here, this area right here, okay. arcade and gaming. Okay. Uh, this would be a dedicated game arcade space for hanging out, chilling, having fun. Um, that will be a built in installation fixture in the space. That's also where our barbecues are going to live, like right by this roll door right there. So the barbecues will roll in from outside, keep them out of the weather, roll back out when we all use them. Um, but that space will be dedicated to having fun, arcade games, um, pinball games, things like that. That's where our consoles will mostly live. So screens up on the wall, a couple of lounge chairs, sit down, play some Smash with your friends. Um, you know, we want this to be a fun space in addition to a really high quality co-working space and an event space and a community space. We want this to be a place where people come <clears throat> and have fun. And you know, everyone needs a break from work at some point. Like grab a soda, go to the arcade room, blow off some steam after that like really stressful meeting, go back to work. Like we want that, want that style of um, of engagement. So yeah, um, would love if you have a big arcade cabinet, would love it. Cool. I just need some help to I'll help you move it. <laughs> All right. Um, any other questions? Any questions from online? Nope. Okay. Great. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate your attention. I'm, yeah. Barbecue social. Friday, barbecue social. Um, please come out if you uh, want a tour of the space. We will be doing tours this evening. Um, for the adjacent space, so come back for that. Um, and then the grill and chill with uh, family and friends. Um, on Friday from five to five to seven, we'll also do a bar or, um, do a tour at that point. So you can walk through and see what the inside looks like right now and start dreaming about what it might look like three months from now. All right, thank you everyone and have a great day.